Today, I visit a facility most of you should recognize, Full Race Motorsports. So this is Full Race, and Jeff here, racer, right? That's right. That's right, is the owner of Full Race. So Jeff, why don't you tell us a little bit about Full Race, for those that don't know what Full Race does. All right. Well, uh, we have been around for, I think, 13 years now. We pride ourselves on building some of the best quality turbo systems in the world. And um, I'm going to show you basically what it takes to build the stuff that we build. So I'll give you a brief tour of the, of the shop. That's exactly so, what I'm here for. So this well, let's right start here, off with this, yeah. This is um, <laughs> our, our welding tank. Most guys use small bottles, but we weld a lot. And so um, what this is actually filled with is liquid argon. And when you buy a, or you rent a tank from a local welding supply, they fill it with gaseous argon. The advantage of liquid argon is that it's much more pure. And when liquid argon is here, it's evaporating constantly. And the evaporate is what we're actually welding with. So if you oh, see up top, cool. you'll see that there's, a, there's actually snow forming on the top of this tank. And what that's causing is it's an expansion from the um, liquid state to the gaseous state. And that allows us to really uh, just provide the ultimate in weld quality because um, ultimately, you have to use really good materials to get a really good product. Right. And what this is allowing us to do is it's just it's part of the materials that, that go into this. So very yeah, cool. This is just kind of the beginning of the process. So over here, we got some cutting machines. Yeah, some big saws. And uh, what we do is we have our own unique alloys that we weld with, and we have to build every single tube into a collector piece. So the tubes will get cut down into different lengths depending on what the collector is. From there it gets a first cut, it'll get a second cut, and then from there it becomes a collector. So this is all the raw materials prep area in this. So in this the, everything that needs to be cut is done here? Uh, all the major cuts, all the right, big cuts. Okay. So we have a guy who works in here, his position is officially called utility worker, and his job is to make it so our super skilled fabricators, our really high paid welders, right. they don't have to waste their time running a saw. I got you, okay. That's sweet. These are just material racks. So as he's welding or uh, prepping a different collector or a different manifold, we're gonna have different size materials depending on what the exact manifold is, what's the power target. So he right. knows, listen, if it's this um, Evo stock turbo, it's gonna be a smaller runner than if it's an 800 horsepower. I gotcha. Manifold. And what, how do you determine, I guess that's how you do determine the thickness of the actual material used on yeah, exactly. the stock manifold. So the size and the thickness are all going to be dictated by what's available. Okay. We have custom alloys, but the sizes and the thickness of the wall is going to dictate on who's pouring the alloy. I got and you. And so we're, we're fixed. You can't, you can't have infinite sizes. You really have about, I guess, close to about 50 different runners you can choose. Right, from. right, right. And it's up to us to know what's appropriate. And a lot of guys, you know, we're just guessing you might go too big or maybe they'll go too small. And, Every application is different, but typically what I see is uh, a lot of people using runners that are way too big for the application. Mm -hmm. so I think it's advantageous to know what the customer's goal is and then custom, customize what the process and the product is. For right, and I think that's what sets you apart from a lot of off-the-shelf stuff, right? You yeah. work with customers and figure out what the best plan of attack for their exhaust manifold is. Yeah, right? what like they, for Evos, what I think we want. make like 14 or 15 different Evo manifolds. For Honda wow. B-Series, we probably make 20 different B-Series. So we make so many different unique configurations that while it's not custom per se, it's pretty custom. Right, I got you. And geez, look at all these flanges here. Holy yeah, smokes. Yeah, all different flanges. So this is RB, this is Ford EcoBoost, Evo 10, Evo 8 9s. Oh, I see. Uh, Ken stuff. will like this. A rotary one right yeah, there. That's for Ken. Yeah. <laughs> it's got H23 or H22, SR20, yeah, 3S GTE. Go. So all sorts of different stuff here. Very so cool. This is just the material prep corner. It's a little dirty over here. Hey, you're working with uh, metal. It's always dirty in my books. Over here, this is uh, collectors. So all of our guys are going to take the material prep. And uh, here, here's a divided. This will soon be an Evo 10 collector. Oh, right. So this one here looks like, oh, that's hot. That's an SR20 collector. And so what these guys do is they're going to um, fuse, tack, weld, and shape the collector piece. This is a four into one. So this is a T3 collector for a K series, uh, 2006 to 2011 Honda Civic SI. And so what he's doing is he's, the collector's finished. It's going to go over to, um, 
Well, this one in particular is for an EFR. You'll notice there's no wastegate port on it. I got you. So if it's for an EFR internal gate, it won't have a wastegate port. If it is for an external gate, it gets the wastegate port. But this will go into uh, turn into a manifold real soon. And in order to do that, here's all the fixtures. Yeah, we look have. at all of these. Holy smokes! Every one of those. 20 Evos or 20 Hondas, whatever it is, each one requires a different fixture or multiple different fixtures. So these are the collector fixtures. These are our manifold fixtures. And then um, what they're going to do is they're going to tack a manifold up. Let's see if they got an example over here. Oh, here they are. Here's the perfect example. Mason's working on this one right now. So this is a, you can see the tacked runners. He's building them into place. So this is the robot welder. Give you a little sneak peek into it. That's a three axis machine, oh, excuse me, four axis machine. So you have your axis of rotation, which is the lathe, and then you have three axes up, down, left, right, and out on the robotic arm. Over here is a, um, this is what he's gonna weld right now. He's working on this one right now. So it's all tacked up. We're gonna drop in the welder. And uh, when it's done, you can kind of see this weld quality. An absolutely flawless weld. There's nothing, nothing that you could do by hand that's gonna, that's gonna come close to this. Right. Yeah, that's super neat. You can see the inside of that weld. There's no sugaring. It's 100% penetration. That's just a perfect internal. Oh wow! Yeah. Weld. Like look at that. No, no disturbances in the inside of the runner. If you weld by hand, it's just not possible. Yeah. So it has to be welded with a robotic. Yeah, in order to get that quality. Very yeah, cool. Exactly. Yeah. So again, we have more fixtures and more jigs here because when you weld something, no matter what you do or no matter how good you weld it, it's gonna warp. So even on a robotic process, it's gonna warp a little bit. So each one of these are so that when it's done welding, they can actually check how much it's moved. And then if they have to, they can tweak or grind it a little bit to get it right in the spec. Right. So it's always a matter of like tweaking and trying to make it fit as best as possible. Yeah, when you're hand making a product, you're gonna deal with things that just aren't an issue when you're running them on a CNC mill. I got gotcha. you. Hand fabricated welded parts are definitely unique in, in the challenges they're gonna present. So this is a finished Mazda Speed manifold. There's actually five of them right here. We just did a batch. You can see perfect welds all the way across. It's waiting for a final decking and then QC. Every single Subaru header that we build, we have to verify the fitment on the engine. If it's not verified on the engine, you can almost be certain that there's so some there's going to be issues just because of yeah. the, the dual head design. Exactly, and you have head gaskets and stacking tolerances that are present in a Subaru engine, which really aren't present in other engines. So it's it's been a learning curve for us. We started Subaru about eight years ago, and it took us a full three, three and a half years until we were competent enough to sell quality products. Wow. And it's now our best selling uh, import uh, kit. So if you're into Subarus, more than likely you know who Full Race is yeah, and you're aware of our, our kit quality. Yeah. What, what he's doing over here is he's going to go over the manifold, deburr it, remove any sharp edges, and then he'll port the inside of the runners to make sure there's good flow. Sweet. And I see a, uh, a Subaru car back here. Yeah, this is a half cut. This is our shop Subaru. <laughs> um, again, what we were talking about. Uh, Subarus being very difficult for tolerance stacking because of the two different cylinder heads and gaskets and blocks. It also gets very difficult because you have to pass a lot of pipes through what's a very narrow area right here where my hand is. And so we actually fit every single Subaru turbo kit manifold downpipe in the car. And that way we know when we ship the kit to the customer, its fitment is spot on. And we have a lot of customers tell us, especially shops, that our kits are the best fitting Subaru kits they've ever installed. There's no issues, and we know the reasons why, because the tab is mounted on the transmission. The up pipe is fitted through the, um, the tunnel right here. The right. down pipe clears the firewall perfectly. So all the little bits and pieces that have to fit are actually fitted in the car before shipping it. Right over here, we're in the down pipe area. Um, these are all of our down pipe fixtures. And um, we'll see stuff that ranges in size from a three inch to a four inch to a five inch. Five inch isn't uh, too common. We have a few Supras that are real high power that'll do five inch, but more than 90% of our applications are three inch, and three can support a whole lot of power, a lot more than people think it will. Right. And it's also not that loud. I've when you get into the larger that, yeah. diameter stuff, it really gets old to drive on the street. Yeah. So 
more often than not, we'll do three inch, but on occasion we'll do three and a half, four, five. Yeah. So for all you guys running street cars with high horsepower, three inches, all day. usually good enough. Yeah, I've, I've had three and a half and fours on street cars on my own personal stuff, and all of it is back to three. Yeah. This is a RB26 twin turbo manifold to fit two EFR 7163s. So if you're looking to make in excess of 800 horsepower, coming close to 1,000 or 1,100 horsepower, this is the best way I know how to do it. It actually uses internal wastegates, so um, some people might think that means less power than an external wastegate, but not at all. It definitely does not work that way for this particular application. Wow, cool. It's a techie manifold. There's a lot of stuff to package in the RB. I believe it, and it's tight for space in there too, right? Yeah, there's just no room. And so it fit two big EFRs, a crazy manifold, two dump tubes, down pipes, intake pipes, charge pipes, oil lines, water lines. You got a lot of stuff to cram in there. So over here is uh, all of our intercooler cores that come from the suppliers. Yep. And um, so on the left side, you'll have the intercooler cores and the end tanks. On the right side, we have all the charge pipes. And what these two guys do all day long is they just pump out aluminum. This is our aluminum only section. So the thing with aluminum is you want to have different welders, different tools, but it's basically the same process as downpipes, so that's why we like to have it in this particular area. Yeah, I gotcha. And they do all the welding behind this... Uh, yeah, and then and then he has another welder right for I gotcha, here. I gotcha, very cool. Every uh, inner cooler that we make, we boost leak test it to 65 pounds. So, clamp this one on one side, clamp this on the other, full the intercooler com full of uh, compressed air and make sure that there are no leaks because even a pinhole leak will cause turbocharger overspeed. Yeah. And it'll reduce power so we want to make sure every one that we ship is not is not going to leak. Here's a this one is a Mustang EcoBoost intercooler in process. You can see the tapered end tank. It's a little bit more aerodynamic lower volume and oh, yeah. uh, that gives higher heat transfer rates and a little bit quicker spool. Very cool. So we are in the shipping area and this is where all the turbo kits and turbos go through. Yeah, you it's, got a lot of Borg Warner stuff here. Tell me yeah, more about that. Yeah, we've got a lot of EFR Borg Warners and some Airworks. We are Borg Warner's biggest distributor for performance turbos. Very cool. We have pretty much every turbo that you could imagine from Borg Warner in stock. If it's for a performance application, we have it here. So for people looking for EFRs, you are the place to call. EFRs, and we have a new series called SXE, which is their non ball bearing journal bearing um kind of a value driven drag racer turbo whereas the right car is more of a response road racer drift type more of, more of a premium turbo yeah it's a higher yep. end ball bearing response whereas the, the airworks is a lot more affordable easy to rebuild and it still makes plenty of jam right on so um right here we have a this is a top mount twin scroll manifold kind of came off the line here is a f-150 intercooler Broken RB26 cylinder head. <laughs> Going to Head Games in New Jersey with a RB26 manifold for it. Right. There's on. a F150, um, big F150 radiator for EcoBoost F150. So do you guys make radiators? Yeah, we make uh, really only for higher volume stuff. We don't we don't like to do small jobs, but I know, gotcha. For F150s and oh, ah, right on. I didn't know Hondas. that. See, I learn radiators. something new every day. This is a a 2000 degree coating we apply to the. Um, turbine housings we have high temp coating equipment here so we, we coat all of our ho housings and manifolds in in house right on here's some subaru kits this is a subaru that's a subaru this this one? Oh, evo 10 evo 10 has been real popular for us lately you have an evo 10 right not anymore oh, got i got an evo 8 now oh okay me too right on. yeah um these things are actually what started the shop back in the day these are traction bars i started these things when i was in high school and um, that turned into this whole mess, so. Wow. Yeah. And do you, I assume you still sell them. Yeah, it's amazing. Like 20 years later, we're still selling traction bars for 92 up, or 88 up Honda Civics. And that's pretty and rad. All that, and yeah. tell me more about the cars up on the hoist here. And I see a 240. Yeah. I'm sure all the right subscribers right and viewers of this video <laughs> are intrigued I'll drop this to see down. what's going on here. So right now, um, this is our EcoBoost development vehicle. This was a SEMA 2015 car that we built for Ford uh, for SEMA two years ago, and it has been nonstop under the gun. So right here, you see the stock 
radiator to stock intercooler. I wasn't even planning on showing you this today, but it's here, so it's perfect. <laughs> it's a very small intercooler and a pretty small radiator yeah. for what this is. So, um, I have a mock-up right now. This is my first article prototype radiator. We've had this intercooler in production for a while, but what's really cool about this setup is that it allows you to put an oil cooler where the OEM intercooler used to sit. And it's a really nice, nice location for it. It's protected against uh, any damage by, by the intercooler, obviously, but the cars run warm. And if you're gonna track any car, you really need to improve oil cooling. Very cool, right on, car yeah. Like this, so. I'll drop it down, I'll show you what's in the engine there. This is the 2.3 liter EcoBoost. So it's the first time um, they've employed twin scroll turbocharging to this car. And it's very difficult to make a turbo kit for this engine. The cylinder head is a really weird shape. You can kind of see this thing right here. That's what the cylinder head looks like. Wow. And to fabricate a manifold like that, it is possible to do, but it is not fun. It's very painful. And we're really good at fabricating yeah, manifolds. expensive, I'm sure. So what this is, is a highly developed, this is actually, oh, hang on. This is probably the ninth iteration. We have made so many changes over the years. Oh, wow, yeah. Uh, we've Trying got- to figure it out. Yeah, exactly. We have a uh, CFD aerodynamicist who's working for us now, who's mm -hmm. helping do some CFD optimizations and improving things. And this is the final part. It's gonna be made in Inconel in the next um, next few months as a final production piece. So we're, I'm really excited about this. This is a big project for me. Uh, what you see here, this actually has a prototype of it on the engine. It's gonna run with a EFR 7670. And the idea is to have a responsive 500 horsepower. And it's a heavy car. It's 32, 3300 pounds. That's, that's after weight reduction, so you really, it takes some, some power to get this thing to jam. But um, you see the intercooler, the radiators here. This is our cold air intake tube into an air box. We've got a, oh, actually this is one of the cooler things. We've got a set of Penske dampers. Penske actually designed the new S550 Mustang dampers on this car. And it's gonna be on the Shelby Super Snake, I think it's called, something like that, some crazy Mustang. So it's kind of cool being a part, having a part to play with upper level motorsports organizations yeah, like bet. them. What about power wise for people? What what can you expect out of a turbo kit on a Mustang like this? The stock motor is pretty strong. The cylinder head, however, does not flow a whole lot and the cams are very small. Oh, uh, okay. So power wise, I mean, we know someone had made 600 or 640 or something like that, but it was very laggy because they had a huge turbo to do it. Um, I've even seen some guy claimed 900 horsepower at SEMA last year, which I just flat out don't believe. <laughs> I've spent so much time on the flow bench. Yeah. This I just, I can't see that happening. So, so it's I, a realistic number. Realistic, I think 400 yeah. stock motor is totally realistic. I think 500 stock motor. responsive. Yeah. yeah, 400 and responsive. 500 stock motor is getting into the, uh, you're probably gonna have cylinder head flow issues where it's just not flowing enough. But if you get head work, cams will eventually happen. You know, the 600, 700 horsepower stuff is gonna happen. But um, in my mind, I'm actually kind of thinking that this is really a four, 500 horsepower market. And then mm -hmm. where I want things to go is if you see that motor that's up there, that's a 3.5 liter F-150 EcoBoost V6 that I really wanna put in this car. So <laughs> probably will happen come the end of summer, maybe early fall next year. Well, we'll make sure to follow up on that. Depending on yeah, a few things, but it's actually pretty incredible. That, that motor will bolt in. OEM motor mounts, OEM tranny mounts, and you can you can do an F-150 twin turbo V6 swap. Oh, dope. Right on. New school a little bit, right? Yeah. Try new things. And what about uh, the 240 here? Oh, this is... And the other engines. I'm sure yeah, this everyone's is super curious about my this mock stuff. Up, uh, my lab. Whenever I'm working on a Subaru, whatever, this is the Subaru motor I pull out. If we're doing Evo or... Whatever, there's an Evo motor. There's a RX7 13B right here. Oh yeah. There's a that B series. Tidy. SR20, bunch of K series stuff. Evo 10 here. Yeah. RB26. So yeah, just a variety of different projects. I never know what I'm working on. Good to have the engine. I can just pull it out. Of course, put yeah. Put parts on it. Yep, yep, yep. This thing here is actually, I built this car when I was like, I think 18 years old. And I don't obviously drive it. This is my permanent SR20 fixture. <laughs> I don't know what I'm gonna do with this thing. I own four broken 240s at the moment. 
So really, like literally this thing is just the perfect jig. You shouldn't say that uh, on camera because there's gonna be a million people <laughs> like, we wanna buy this car from you. <laughs> well, whatever, man. If you want this car, it's all yours, PT. <laughs> I might uh, come come claim that in a bit. Yeah, I already have too many cars myself, so. It was actually insanely hard to get this. It's an OEM S15, like front bumper, headlights, everything with OEM S14 side skirts. Yeah. So this car has been through hell, man. It's drove it from New Jersey out to here. And yeah, it's, if cars could tell stories, it's amazing. I never, I never bet. piled this thing. I, I believe it. <laughs> All right, Jeff. Well, thank you so much for letting us walk through here and experience Full Race Motorsports. Where can people find Full Race? Check us out at our website, full-race.com. Uh, Instagram is probably a good thing, at Full Race Motorsports. And Facebook, you can hit us up there um, at, at Full Dash Race Motorsports, but uh, more likely than not, it'll be on Instagram since that's what everybody uses. That's anymore. right. Get on that IG. <laughs> Get on the gram. If you guys want to support what we're up to here, you can check out our Patreon page. And if you don't, that's cool too. Yeah.